Yeah, I just got, I'm going to finish by saying Buddha on the name Demi and Nunga. As the Nunga's always say, hopefully we'll catch up soon and we'll have a chat then. Thanks. Powerful sound, isn't it? Just uh, really <coughs> starts things well. Um, so straight on to Brendan. We um, he, he only needs to be called a professor tonight because he's on Curtin University ground, and uh, this is this is him being a, a professor. He's been a lot in his life, but uh, this is the first time he's um, acting as a professor, and we're very pleased to have him as part of us. Um, uh, Brendan's uh, going to tell us a little bit about his journey from Africa through the Kimberley to where he is now uh, as the chair of the Dampier Port Authority and Horizon Power, uh, doing lots of other things as well. And somewhere in between he was running the state government um, for a while. And <coughs> um, before that, Argyle Diamonds. And I, that's where I met um, Brendan first when I was doing the sustainability strategy for the state and looking for good case studies and couldn't believe it when I found this story of what was going on up in the Kimberley and how powerful a, a message it was of what uh, a com company can do about uh, a problem that seemed to be beyond us. So we'll hear some more about that tonight and what it can mean in mainstreaming sustainability. We're well beyond the kind of flag waving we were doing back then in 2001. Uh, people like Peter Elliott and so on here are uh, making a living out of it these days. Um, and we've got 60 PhD students here in CUSP uh, working away on the, the mainstreaming of sustainability. It's a, uh, it's a great word and it, uh, it will continue to have resonance here. So I will hand over to Brendan Hammond. Adjunct Professor, uh, and uh, welcome you to CUSP. Peter, thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as I stand here a little bit away from the mic, can you all hear me clearly? Great, great. Um, firstly, I'd like to pay my respects through Len to the traditional owners of this country. Len, and thank you very much indeed for the welcome to country. It's most appreciated. Um, secondly, Peter, thanks to you. Uh, just to put my heart on my sleeve about Peter, uh, I have the view that Peter is the most significant identity in Australia today in terms of achieving sustainable outcomes. Uh, Peter, it's an honour to have had and continue a relationship with you and an honour to be here at CUSP um, in my inaugural lecture as an adjunct professor. Uh, there are two other people who I need to thank uh, before I get going, uh, Eric Stanton Clements and Darren Billsborough who helped me put this presentation together. Um, I'm very good at chucking down dot points on, uh, on, on PowerPoint but actually making them into art, the artwork required for a speech, quite frankly, is beyond me. Um, and of course, lastly, to all of you who've taken time out of your lives on a Friday evening to come along and to listen to this, uh, I deeply appreciate it, and I sincerely trust that you will walk away with much, much more than you thought was possible from tonight. Now, to start with, I was asked, as Peter mentioned, to do a bit of an introduction to myself. And um, it's been an interesting journey and continues to be an interesting journey. I was born in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, in the mid-50s and went to school there and in South Africa, studied in South Africa and eventually wound up becoming a metallurgist. And as a metallurgist, I worked in the mining industry both in South Africa and the deep gold mines uh, and in Rhodesia. Um, and I left Rhodesia in 1979, uh, just at the point that Rhodesia was becoming independent to Zimbabwe. Um, 
And uh, I joined as a metallurgist, Rio Tinto, in southwest Africa, uh, at the Rossing uranium mine. Uh, this was in the, in the early 80s. And Rossing uranium at that time was the largest single producer of uranium oxide in the world. Um, and it was a very, very, very interesting place. I spent 18 years there, working my way up through the ranks from metallurgist to a senior executive. And it was at Rossing that I started to look at the world beyond the mine. And it was at Rossing that I started to learn from a lot of other very wise people that mining should be about much, much more than mining. And it was at Rossing that my ongoing passion for the mainstreaming of sustainability was born. And the mainstreaming of sustainability is a constant theme and part of my personal journey, and it's why I stand here today. After having spent 18 years at Rossing, I was sent across here to Western Australia uh, by Rio Tinto on promotion to General Manager Operations at Argyle. And I arrived here in 1997 and spent the following eight years at Argyle. Uh, as Peter mentioned, it was at Argyle that I met Peter. Um, uh, Peter, Eric and I co-authored, and I apologise for the, uh, the, the quality of the slide, you can't see it very clearly, but we co-authored chapter 37 of the book that Peter uh, wrote at the time, which was Management Models for Corporate Social, Social Responsibility. And uh, the chapter that we wrote together was about, at that time, how sustainability could add to corporate social responsibility. And of course, here we sit tonight, and my entire message to you, apart from anything else, is that sustainability, properly applied, transcends corporate res social responsibility. Um, and effectively renders it as something of the past because it becomes integrated and is something that you do anyway. Um, having spent eight years at Argyle, uh, I came to the conclusion that I'd done what I could do in Rio Tinto, in the mining industry, and that the time had come to move on and out. So I left both Argyle and Rio Tinto, having been the General Manager of Operations and the Managing Director of Argyle, um, and set up a boutique consultancy business. And the first assignment that I got in the consultancy business was to personally consult to uh, two successive premiers of the state as the development approvals coordinator. And it was fascinating because I reported directly to the Premier of the State and my task was to effectively drive the approvals processes on a whole of state government basis for all major state developments. And at the time that that assignment came to a close, three years later, we had something like $80 billion worth of development projects that we were managing. Uh, together with the agencies of the state. Um, and we achieved a great deal. And we achieved a great deal by, apart from anything else, um, driving home some of the principles that I'll talk to you about tonight. Uh, apart from anything else, uh, what was the case then, and I believe remains the case largely across much of state bureaucracy, is that very few of the pieces of government are focused on outcomes. They tend to be highly focused on process. And there's a consistent theme about that, not only in state government, but in local government, in national governments, and indeed in national governments across the world. Once the assignment at ODAC was complete, uh, I then continued consulting, and since then, and I continue to consult today, uh, since then and on an ongoing basis, I have 
had the honour to chair the boards of, firstly, Horizon Power, and there are a number of the Horizon Power uh, senior staff in the room tonight. Um, and there, I know, is a reason for that, not just because I happen to be the chair. Uh, likewise, I chair the Dampier Port Authority, and there are a number of staff members from the Dampier Port Authority in the room tonight. And thanks to all of you. Um, now, the reason why they are here tonight is, um, and this is where I'll move on from who I am and why I'm here, is that as I go forwards in life and as this journey of mainstreaming sustainability continues, so I have found that regardless of what it is I do, um, whether I chair a board, whether I engage in a consultancy assignment, uh, whether I provide advice to the great and the small, it doesn't matter. It all comes down to the same thing. Whatever I do merely wind up, winds up as being a different facet on a large three-dimensional crystal that shines into the same core. Getting on to the mainstreaming of sustainability, and what I'm going to do tonight is to try and share with you um, essentially a dialogue and a story all woven into one. Um, I'm going to go back and start with the story of Argyle in a condensed way because it is very instructive as to the underlying principles for the mainstreaming of sustainability. And the Argyle story is a fairly classic turnaround story. In 1997, it was a mine that was close to the end of its life. It was in, apparently in terminal decline. The shareholders were despairing. There was forecast closure in 2001. And that was looking inside. Looking outside, we had a business that had made a fair amount of money over its life, but it had reinforced indigenous disadvantage, and it had also reinforced beyond indigenous disadvantage, regional dysfunction. Internally, it had an employee base who largely had a mindset of entitlement. And their main focus was not about the mine and where the mine was going and what might happen with the mine. Their main focus was around managing their own lives and the forthcoming redundancies with closure. Um, by the end of 1998, it had started to look like a different business. The business had turned around there was energy, there was innovation, there was efficiency, effectiveness, and it had reached beyond its own limits and had started designing and implementing a very major focus on regional development. Not unsurprisingly from that, by 2000, we'd, under, we'd discovered an entirely new underground resource Local employment and procurement were well established and growing and there was robust profitability. Um, dwelling on that profitability for a second, um, I, I'm sure that most of you will have read um, either in the press or in, uh, in, in novels the, the way in which the diamond industry uh, had historically been controlled by De Beers. Um, well, that was fact. And indeed... In 1998, De Beers was toddling around all of the major cust diamond customers in the world, persuading customers to cease their contracts with Argyle because Argyle was going down the tubes. And that had the result of reducing our prices. And in early 98, we found it very difficult to make any money. So we turned that around to a, a, a story of robust profitability. And you'll notice what I'm doing here. I'm sharing with you a classic business school story of a business that did some really wonderful smart things and turned itself around, apparently. By 2005, which is when I left, the mine life 
had been extended to 2020 plus. There was an Indigenous participation agreement in place, which was more than just an Indigenous participation agreement. It was an Indigenous participation agreement set in a rigorous context of regional development. The underground expansion was underway, and as a result of the regional benefits that Argyle had by that stage over the previous seven years been able to demonstrate in practical terms to local and regional government, Argyle was able to negotiate a royalty reduction which assisted it to stay in business into the future. And to my knowledge, today, Argyle remains the only mining operation in the country that has successfully negotiated a royalty reduction with the state government. Just to conclude the 2005 chapter, to give you some feeling of the sort of incremental value that flowed in terms of money from this exercise, the after-tax profits that flowed to Rio, after-tax profits, as a result of the turnaround from closure in 2001 to the end of 2005 was something in the order of five billion Australian dollars. It's a lot of money. So an interesting business school story, must have you all riveted. The issue is what really happened? What actually went on at Argyle? And looking at it backwards, it was very interesting because it wasn't just a new management team comes in and does new stuff. There was a very specific framework and process that was followed. Firstly, a new context was set. And you recall that I said to you that when I was working in the uranium industry in Namibia, I developed a passion and learnt a lot about mining is more than mining. And one of the things that I learnt and which I continue to develop the theme of is that an ore body, and indeed I extend this to all natural resources, are endowment assets. And that context, that change in context from, well, we're a mining business and we're here to generate net present value and great returns for the, share, for the shareholder, by setting this context of an ore body as an endowment asset, a new vision emerges. And that new vision is that a mining business is more than a mining business. A mining business is an agent that converts an endowment asset to a series of intergenerational assets. And that the only reason for having a mine or to exploit any natural resource is that one is able to demonstrate that you can convert that endowment asset to a series of assets which are of equal or greater value, economic, social and environmental. And that's indeed what happened at Argyle. We did this also by implementing very rigorous systems of leadership and governance. And so the equation emerges as to what actually happened at Argyle. It's less a story about a great business that made a lot of money than it is a story of a new context plus a new vision plus governance always creates a new business. And a new business can be proxy for anything. It doesn't have to be a commercial enterprise. So here we have a really interesting story of a sad legacy that became part of a solution. Built a bridge to the future and resulted in benefits in perpetuity. So what's that all about, really? 
mainstreaming sustainability, managing the future, creating economic value, an interesting series of questions. And as I consider the way in which we generically manage life, it seems to me that part of the issues that we see facing us every day and at this particular juncture in history, possibly most poignantly, is that we indeed choose to separate these things where in fact they are indeed always all one and the same. And we sub-optimise by managing them and by dealing with them and by considering them separately. So I want to, in the context of these things are all the same, I want to now move into frameworks, systems and processes to start unpacking this a little bit more. And I'd like to start by indulging in some really um, thought, some thoughts that, which may strike many of you as being obvious and simplistic. And indeed, most of these things are obvious. The problem is that because they're obvious, we simply assume they're all in place and we fail to manage them and to take account of them properly. And the first point I'd like to make to you is this, that all outcomes always exist in perfect equilibrium with the process that produces them. And thus that if you want to change an outcome and you want to change an outcome permanently, you have to change the system that produces it. And from that, the corollary is that initiatives never, ever, ever produce permanent change. And I know this is obvious to everybody. The problem is that we don't take this obvious to everybody into normal life. Um, and initiatives are really interesting. I, I, the mental model I like about initiatives is this, that imagine we're all on a runaway train together. Um, and it's barreling down a hill. We're all in the carriages and it's going faster and faster and faster. Um, and draw the parallels with what I'm about to say to everyday life, today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Um, and particularly now across the world. Um, so we look at one another and we all come up with different ideas of what to do. And somebody says, well, you know, if we rip up the floor planks and stick it out the window and jam the floor planks in against the wheels, we're going to slow this train down. And so what do we do? We rip up the floor planks, we chuck them out the windows, we all get busy, we lean on them, and we create lots of smoke and flame, and we're all very busy, and the train slows down. So we all look at one another and we say, gee, it's working, give me more planks. And we jam more planks in. Eventually the planks run out, and guess what? The train picks up speed, and off it goes because none of us got into the driver's seat, into the engine room, and actually took control of the drivers of the runaway train. So initiatives, we surround ourselves in them all the time. And I think, and this is not being critical, but I think we are guilty as sustainability practitioners of too often indulging in initiatives rather than sustainability process and systemic change. And every time we engage in a sustainability initiative that proves itself not to be sustainable, we erode our own credibility. And it is fixing that that is one of my greatest passions. So moving on to another fairly obvious statement that the future happens regardless. Um, and uh, I, I do have to remark here that um, there, are, there are the Horizon and Dampier Port Authority 
um, staff in this room, many of whom have seen much of these words previously. Because as chair of the board in running those businesses and in providing a service to those businesses, uh, you'll recall I said to you, no matter what facet I use, I come to the same stuff. Well, they've heard this before because it is the same stuff. So the future happens regardless. It really sounds pretty trite, but it does raise some fundamental questions about ourselves and what we do and what position we choose to take in terms of the future happens regardless. And particularly in the context of the previous slide about initiatives versus systemic change. Do we want to change the future? Are we serious about it? Is a question for all of us as individuals and as any grouping of individuals, be it from family to commercial enterprise to NGO to academic institution, it really doesn't matter. The question is common. Do we choose to exert control over the future? Do we choose to avert known adverse outcomes rather than talk about them? Do we choose to minimise unexpected adverse outcomes? Do we choose to reduce risk? And of course, if the answer to any of those is yes or partly yes, then we have to stand up and do something. We have to take accountability for the future and we have to discharge this accountability. And to do that means we have to control and exert control over the process that creates outcomes, which is simply another cut of saying what I've already said. We have to get back to systemic change. It does draw one to think about leadership and in the context of this discussion, what leadership is all about. Because apart from anything else in the context of this discussion, I would put to you that leadership is about a path on a continuum from I'm subject to a future which is determined by others or I'm subject to a process that create its outcomes, all the way through to the other end of the spectrum, which is where I own the future. I, I control the process that creates outcomes. I'm the author and I own my destiny. Whether that be the I, as in me personally, or whether that be the I as in larger groups of us. So let's look now to the process that creates outcomes. Because what I'm going to suggest to you is that this process is generic. That it's not something that's about a mining industry or um, anything specific. It's the way we do things as human beings, regardless of where we come from, what language we speak, what country we live in. The process is the same. And the process is this, and I'll run down the left-hand side first, that why always drives what, always drives how, which always drives do. And it always happens that way around. In management speak, thus, context results in vision, the two of those things together are called intent. Intent drives strategy. Strategy drives a process of implementation. And a process of implementation, large or small, always consists of some form of organisation amongst ourselves to get something done, or even if it's on our own, some sort of arrangement of ourselves to get the thing done. The implementation or design and implementation of systems which result in behaviour and behaviour creates outcomes. And that process is always, always there. It doesn't matter what we do. It's always there. It's always in order and it's always in equilibrium. And to control that process requires an integrated approach of leadership and governance. And before I move on, 
I want to give you some further examples. I've given you one of Argyle, where a change of context and vision drove a complete change through how a business functioned. Um, if, if we look around ourselves today, I'll give you another example, the Dampier Port Authority. Um, the Dampier Port Authority three years ago was a port authority that, alongside all others in Western Australia, had a future and a vision that was expressed as facilitating trade. Yes, that was the corporate vision. Um, that vision has changed. The Dampier Port Authority now sees itself as a gateway to Australia. It's very different. And it sees itself as a gateway to Australia in the context of the generation of intergenerational assets. And what's emerging from that as an entirely new, dynamic, innovative port business that doesn't look like anything that I know of anywhere else in this country that's a port. Further beyond us, and I'll now offer you some examples of failure, where um, we're all subject to the media storm about the mining tax. And isn't it interesting that the entire conversation about the mining tax didn't have a whisper of context about the importance of our endowment resources and the conversion of them to in perpetuity assets. And how different the mining tax discussion might have been if it was informed by that sort of context. Closer to home, the Pilbara. I'm not aware yet, despite the earnest work of so many people, I'm not aware yet of any context or vision for the Pilbara in terms of what it is today, which is, frankly, a large, diverse quarry. And yet we have government initiatives that are driving towards a Pilbara city or Pilbara cities. And yet we're going to build cities with no idea and no thought given to the reason and rationale for a city to exist anywhere in the Pilbara. It may or may not be a very, very good idea. I happen to think it probably is a very good idea. But it's not being done with any appropriate context or vision. It's wave your arms in the air and let's build a Dubai in the Pilbara. Um, well, that's not good enough because that's not going to wind up with an appropriate conversion of endowment assets into intergenerational assets, I would suggest. So you can see how intent and failure to address intent properly either drives great outcomes or doesn't drive great outcomes. Just a short picture for you of integrating leadership and governance. Um, I've used the word and the term once before, building a bridge to the future. I'll expand on that a little shortly. But leadership, fundamentally, is about building a bridge to the future. Governance and the process of governance is about getting your hands around these things that create outcomes and ensuring that you create intent and link intent to outcomes and do this in a very deliberate way. Rigor, disciplined, disciplined rational and informed decision making. And now unpacking building a bridge to the future. And I've, I've set out for convenience the steps because I think they are pretty easy. We set the context and 
we innovate a future destination from that context, which is called a vision. We script a path to get there. We generate and maintain motion, we involve, we energize, and we collaborate. As we do this, we create knowledge and we create opportunity. And the fact is that as you create knowledge and opportunity together, you create accountability everywhere. It has to start at the top and work down. It doesn't work any other way. And ultimately, as one iterates, everybody becomes a leader. And so it goes viral. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the creation of intent because it is my view that the failure to address the creation of intent properly is where too often all of us fail at all levels, from a societal level all the way down to us as individuals. It is also clearly the point of greatest leverage as we look forwards. Uh, we need to address this stuff very, very clearly. Um, let me pose a rhetorical question to all of you. Australia, who are we, where are we going, and why? I wrestle with that question every day. And I fail to see anywhere the mechanisms of setting context and designing intent for us as a country that we need. So I want to talk about the creation of intent because this is the mainstreaming of sustainability. And I will argue that it is at this level that sustainability is mainstreamed. And that without doing it at this level, sustainability winds up as an initiative. It doesn't get mainstreamed. And sustainability itself and sustainability initiatives are not sustainable. There can be few people in the world who would argue with the concept of what is our primary job as human beings in the world? Well, it's to make the world a better place. It's to give more than we take, consume less than we generate, or to leave behind more than we have inherited. And again, this is one of these really obvious, sort of simplistic things to say. But as with all of these simple concepts and as with all of these simplistic statements, it's when you start teasing them apart slightly that they become very, very much more complex and they indeed prove themselves possessed of enormous power. Um, when we say we want to make the world a better place, we want to give more than we take, leave behind more than we inherit, and particularly leave behind more than we inherit, which I'm sure none of us would disagree with. It really is interesting to um, start off by thinking of this at a very personal level. And, and, and if you can forgive me for being quite brutal about it, um, what one has actually said there is this, that we have a cycle of life. We're born, we live, and we die. And in that cycle of life, there are two primary transactions that take place that we're concerned with. We've already said that. The first transaction is that the, at the time we're born, we inherit from those who've died at the same time an umbrella of influence over a whole pile of in, intergenerational assets to build and to create those across our lifetime no matter how long we live. 
And of course, when we die, the same transaction happens in reverse. And it is a transaction. If we accept that we leave behind more than we inherit, this is a transaction. And thus, forgive me, I have a business background. It means that every day of my life as I live, um, it would be very useful to understand that process and to understand how the intergenerational assets that I have custodianship of are growing. And it causes me to want to expand my umbrella of influence as widely as I possibly can. It causes me to step beyond my own parochial boundaries. And it's also really interesting because as we consider the growth and creation of intergenerational assets, which is what all of those things say, so we get to understand that it's not ever about a compromise. It is always about the best possible balance. And balance is not compromise. And when we look further at intergenerational assets, it becomes really, really interesting because, um, first of all, there's a profit imperative because I need to make sure that the value of assets, intergenerational assets tomorrow, exceeds the value of intergenerational assets today. Um, I, I think and I know there are some very smart accountancy brains in the room. Um, and I think that looks like making a profit to me. The value of outcomes exceeds expenses. Waste and inefficiency, and I apologise for the spelling error there, uh, waste and in inefficiency serve nobody. So that when I walk into a municipal toilet and the tap is dripping, This is a waste, and it's about needlessly consuming intergenerational assets. And all waste and all inefficiency is counterproductive in terms of the generation of, or the creation of intergenerational assets. Secondly, the time frame imperative, short, medium, and long term. And we intuitively know this. What is the point of shortchanging tomorrow in the interests of today? What is the point of shortchanging the interests of today for tomorrow? Neither makes sense. It's always all about balance. The value imperative. Everything has value. Just because it doesn't happen to be in the form of a dollar bill doesn't mean it doesn't have value. There is no reason for us to climb in our motor cars after breakfast with our families where we exist in a fairly sane way and to sort of lobotomize ourselves when we go to work, which is sadly what we tend to do. And I do say we where we go to work and suddenly the world is a different place when we go to work. It's all about all and it's not about and. And of course it's fallacious. And finally this integration imperative that I've been talking about. And, not all. Balance, <coughs> not compromise. So as one considers, having gone from the phrase of um, I'm going to leave more behind than I inherited. As we unpack it and look at what it is, so we're forced to come to the conclusion that, first of all, that is about the creation of intergenerational assets. And secondly, that this is nothing more nor less 
than great business, and I mean business very generically here, and nothing more nor less than great business, And so I would conclude as follows, that mainstreaming sustainability means that sustainability must inform context. And I hope that I've been able to draw the links and connect the dots for you sufficiently tonight to see how as soon as you look at life from a rational, unemotional, logical perspective and you go from this apparently soft, fuzzy, I want to make the world a better place through a mental process of, well, if I want to make a, the world a better place, then I better take control of the future. And that that taking control of the future leads you irrevocably to one place, which is that sustainability must inform context. And that at its highest level, context is always about the creation of intergenerational assets. And sustainability is about integration. More than anything else, it's about integration. You've got to do everything right all the time. It's far more pervasive in its drive than anything else that I'm aware of. Certainly far more pervasive in business than the boss saying, um, we really need to lift our game so that we improve return to shareholders. Because by doing this, you improve return to shareholders anyway. They always get the best return. Rigorous governance is essential. And it is here where I believe, generically, we fall down all the time. Because we don't give due regard often enough to all of the elements that create outcomes. They all need to be managed, and they all need to be managed well all the time. It has to be built from the top down. Life starts with context. I have a little story about how important context is in brushing your teeth, because we all brush our teeth every, teeth every morning, but we brush our teeth, and lying in the back of our minds is indeed intent, context and vision. And I'd share this demonstration to you as follows, that let us assume there are two of us who brush our teeth, teeth in the morning. And uh, um, ladies, forgive me, I'm going to take a male cut on this. Um, so we both brush our teeth, two of us, brush our teeth early in the morning, and we don't give a great deal of thought as to why. But lying behind it, and I'll take Eric as my counterpart, um, I brush my teeth in the morning because when I was growing up, my mum told me it was really, really important to brush my teeth because if my teeth weren't clean, my oral health would suffer. And that would mean that I wouldn't have good, healthy teeth for the rest of my life. Now, I don't give any thought to that as I brush my teeth. But lying in the back of my mind, it's there. Eric, on the other hand, has been brought up. And his mum was less rigorous in that fashion with him. But what Eric learned at an early age, because he's a strapping, handsome fellow, is that... Nice teeth make you quite attractive. They give you a great smile. So we've got two entirely different contexts, but all we do is brush our teeth. Now let me put it to you this, in this way, that we both come to our mid-twenties. Um, and I, despite all my brushing of teeth for oral hygiene, um, I have had to have all my teeth pulled out and I've got dentures. And I cannot help but look myself in the mirror and contemplate that in brushing my teeth, I have failed. Eric, two years earlier, proactively decided 
that because he had twisted teeth, he'd pull them out and put dentures in. I hope that helps to tell you how important context is because it's always there. And the problem is too often we don't manage it, we assume it. So there are no secrets about how to get things done. This stuff about context drives strategy, drives structure, drives... <laughs> it's, it's in every business school program I've ever seen. It's management 101. There's really no secret about it. Um, pure vanilla. The big secret, though, is to actually do it. The big secret is not to engage in initiatives, but actually to get your hands around the system <coughs> and manage it. I have, after the conclusion, some closing thoughts. And uh, um, you, you will all be familiar, I'm sure, with, with a lot of those numbers. The big crunch, the explosion of population going from Jesus Christ, 200 million people in the world to today around 6.7 billion and by 2050, 10 billion. And um, the fact is that that's scripted. It's there. Um, and in that picture, the top 10% of us use 20 to 50 times the resources of the bottom 10%. Again, just emphasizing the big crunch to you. All our global ecosystems are in decline. They're our lifeline. That any dispassionate, rational view of us as human beings would define that pretty much all of us sitting in the room here tonight are short-term winners in a system where we have amortized and continue to amortize the future for our comfort and leave that debt for future generations. You try and do the maths around the future, you all know as well as I do that it just sort of doesn't work. And the constraints that we're faced with appear absolute. And I'll suggest to you that there are two ways of looking at this. One is the pessimistic way, which is, oh my God, the world is coming to an end. We're all doomed. We're stuffed. It's do or die. It's the nexus for survival of our species. The other way is to look at it from an optimistic point of view. That human beings are problem-solving animals. That's what we are. And that our progress, as we solve problems, we create other problems, which we go on to solve. And that, yes, of course we can solve this stuff. Because in actual fact, Really, 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 the answers aren't difficult. It's actually getting to doing the answers that's difficult. And this is a magnificent pro problem for us. And the very fact that you have Cusp and Peter and that he snared me in his web, I would suggest to you, is testament to the fact that we are solving it and we will solve it. But we have to get on with things. So, are we going to use the problem to create the solution? Or are we living in the postcards of the future? And those pictures are of a Roman city called Ephesus, which until a thousand uh, uh, after Christ, was the second largest city in the Roman Empire. They cut down all the trees, and it was a port city. They cut down all the trees, the river silted up, and the port wound up three kilometers from the shoreline, which spelt its end as a port city. If they had grabbed control of their environment and their lives, Ephesus would still be there today. Fear abounds. 
And doesn't it just today? How do we create hope? And I would suggest to you that our sole option to create hope and to change the world is indeed by building these bridges to the future and by making it happen. Innovation, good ideas, and the answers, they are everywhere. And we all know that. But they have to be implemented properly. So we do have the power to change the world. I really do believe that. We have the knowledge, we have the accountability. It really is up to us to fulfill that accountability to ourselves and, of course, to the future. And it is up to us to ensure that common good eclipses self-interest. That we're able equally, all of us, individually and collectively, to manage our fear and our greed for common good interest tomorrow. That collaboration eclipses competition and that we endure rather than become extinct. Thank you very much. Let me just finish with a little story. To, um, when Brendan was at Argyle, the big thing that he did was introduce training for Indigenous people so that they could have a workforce that lived locally and worked locally and produced wealth that stayed in the region. And the goal was to reach 40%, which uh, is, is pretty close now, apparently. Uh, but they were rapidly employing a lot of local people. And it was dramatic to see the effect on the local communities. I was there for the signing ceremony, which was done in Oka with hands on the wall to, 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 to share together uh, this uh, vision that they had uh, to sign uh, this uh, agreement uh, with the local people. There were a lot of important people there. The Governor General was there, the Premier of the State was there, there were mining executives and we all shared in this event together. It was a wonderful thing to see. The most impressive thing for me was to see that the 200 Indigenous people there all came up to Brendan at some point and gave him a hug. Now, I think that should be established as a KPI for any CEO. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many Indigenous hugs have you had recently? <laughs> that might change the world. Thank you very much, Brent. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, nice to see you.